Welcome to a lecture on COVID-19 vaccines. My name is Arnav Bhushan, student at Washington University in St. Louis. Like I said, I'm here a student at WashU. I'm a pre-med student. I'm currently enrolled in the second wave of pandemic science and society, which is taught by Dr. Krista Milich, professor of anthropology. All information that I use in this presentation and in this lecture will be cited to its sources and none of it is my own. If any views are shown, they do not reflect the universities, Dr. Millich's, nor anyone except for myself, and I do hold full responsibility for them. I would like to start today's discussion by a quote by Saad Omer, a Yale COVID-19 vaccine researcher. He said, this is evolving science. You are seeing sausages being made in front of the world's eyes. And basically what he's talking about is how incredible it is that we have gotten so many uh, vaccines and companies working on vaccines and scientists, researchers putting their daily lives just to get a vaccine out. And we see that now with the three vaccines that are emergency authorized for use in this country, which we'll get to later. But even along those three, there's many more that are being, uh, they're in phase two, phase three trials that are trying to make this rapid vaccine rollout happen even faster. So this is really truly amazing. And like um, Sado Mayer says, this is really evolving science. So today's lecture will be split up into four parts. The introduction, which is the basics of COVID-19. The second part, we'll talk about the vaccines, explaining the different vaccines. The third goal will be um, the end goal. What does the end of the pandemic look like in our discussion on herd immunity? And the fourth one will just be a wrap up, a conclusion, and I will encourage all to get vaccinated. So let's begin about COVID-19. So SARS-CoV-2 is the official name. We know it as COVID-19, and some people casually call it the coronavirus. However, coronavirus is in fact a type of virus. So there are two main features to a coronavirus. Um, it's the crown-like virus. So if you see these red crown-like things, and it's a positively RNA-stranded virus. So those two things are what classify a virus as a coronavirus. There have actually been seven known coronaviruses in the past. And so when someone were to say coronavirus, it's more of a recency thing. There is not, they're referring to COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, but in reality, there are seven known coronaviruses. And one of the other most famous ones that we know is SARS-CoV-1. So this is SARS-CoV-2, as you can see. And SARS-CoV-1 happened in 2003. And many people were wondering if we've already had SARS-CoV-1, then why was SARS-CoV-2, we're now 15 months into this and we're still trying to fight back. And there are many reasons for that. The first one and the main reason being SARS-CoV-1 was only transmitted through symptomatic carriers. So that means if you could only transmit uh, SARS-CoV-1 if you were symptomatic, if you showed symptoms for the virus. However, SARS-CoV-2, you can show symptoms and be symptomatic and pass and transmit that virus to other people. However, you can also be asymptomatic meaning that you don't show any symptoms, you're, you look perfectly healthy, yet the virus is still inside your body replicating, and yet you transmit that to someone. So it is very hard to um, contact trace, very hard to quarantine people, because frankly, if people who are asymptomatic are not going to be failing screenings for COVID, but yet they're still able to transmit that virus. So SARS-CoV-1 was able to come to an end uh, fairly quickly due to the fact that it was only symptomatic. So they were able to quarantine or isolate people who were, in, um, who were showing symptoms. And then basically once they were healthy, they were released back into society. While in SARS-CoV-2, it gets very difficult. And that's, what's, that's why we're into this pandemic now over a year and still working very hard. So how does SARS-CoV-2 work? When someone says, oh, I have the virus, how does that exactly work? So if we look at this diagram here on the right-hand side, it's the same diagram as I showed on the last slide, except for it's a little more cartoonish. And you can see these spike proteins, these red things. So these are these spike proteins. It's a coronavirus spike protein goes on to the surface of the host cell to lock on. So in our body, in the human body, we have many, many cells, obviously. So this virus, this spike protein comes and locks onto my host cell. Then the virus fuses into that cell. So the crown here, the virus enters a cell and the crown of that protein, which I talked about, the coronavirus has two main features, a crown-like virus, and it's a positively stranded RNA virus. So the crown fuses into the cell. So once it fuses in, that means it's into my cell. And then that virus has the ability to replicate its genome, essentially replicate 
the virus itself into my host cell. And then that goes all around my body. So now the virus is fully immersed into my body. And that's how someone who comes down with the virus gets sick because that virus is now all throughout their body replicating nonstop. Let's take a look at some quick COVID-19 statistics. These are of March 26, 2021, the day I'm recording this lecture. And so right now we're just, just under or above 30 million cases, which is a really grim amount. And deaths are around 550,000. And one of our main targets of this lecture is to analyze graphs. So when we look at these two graphs, in theory, they would be proportionate to each other, obviously with the cases one being much higher because not every single person who comes down with the virus passes away. So we are at 300,000, like I said, and just around 550,000. These graphs show the daily amounts. So the y-axis is much smaller than the cases in the deaths given because this is the daily amount of deaths have in a day. One thing I immediately see off the bat is that in the beginning, the cases, the cases like uh, peak is not as high as the deaths peak. And that's the reason for that. So in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, if you all were paying attention to the news and stuff, we saw that New York was really hard hit. In the beginning, it was like New York is the hotspot of not even the country, but the world. And so many people were wondering, why is that? Why are people getting, like, what's the big deal going on in New York? And essentially, it was just unpreparedness. We were living life normally, and then all of a sudden, within the span of a week, everything gets locked down. Medical professionals are like, like just getting absolutely hammered with patients in New York, and they weren't sure what to do. There was an overflow. The volume of patients was simply too high. And so you see this huge spike in the beginning. While the cases, you don't see that much. However, once the surge in New York started to come back down into the late parts of April and early May, we see throughout the summer, it was pretty relative to the rest of the graph, pretty low. And you see that same thing yeah, in the cases, you see a little, little bit of a, a peak in August. You see that same little peak here in August, but overall pretty proportionate and nothing, nothing scary in the sense compared to what happened in the beginning and nothing for what was unfortunately going to come in the latter half of the year. So into September, October, we start to see the start a slight incline. You see that same sort of incline in the, in the deaths graph. And then you get into November and December where it's really peaking. You have this number just around 200,000, almost up to 250,000, a large, large, large number of total cases. The daily case a day was, like I said, 200, 250,000. And here you have the deaths also reaching its all time high around 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. Some days it even got up to 6,000 here. Some cases even up to here were up into 300,000 range. And so there's one main reason for that, and that's obviously a large majority of this country during the winter, it is cold. People are inside. No one is really outside a, a long time. It, like I said, it's cold. When people are inside, they find the need not to wear a mask that much. Everything's confined. Everyone's breathing and circulating the same air. It's not being thrown out into the natural air and come back in so recirculated. So the virus, that they love that. The virus loves that. They're able to replicate, can infect as many people as they want inside. So that's why it was very detrimental during the winter. And that's why we see once it starts to warm up, fortunately, people are going back outside. So we can see that we're not going to be stuck inside in these confined spaces where it's a, little, a COVID hotspot, especially. And you see that same thing in the deaths. The deaths are going back down once the cases go back down. So except for this early peak in um, New York, the, the rise in cases is very synonymous to the rise in deaths. And the decrease in cases is very synonymous to the decrease in deaths. So they are proportionate to each other. And that's something to really keep in mind when examining these graphs. How to prevent the spread. I'm sure you've heard this lots of times, but I will repeat it again, just so we can continue to stay healthy. The first step, wear a mask. Wear a mask that fits your nose, wear a mask that fits your mouth. It's important it fits both of them and not just one of them. Make sure it's tight around your mouth. We don't want it to be so loose that it's essentially doing nothing and, the, and you're not protecting other people and nor are you protecting yourself. The next thing is social distancing. Stay six feet apart from people. Maintain that distance from people you might not live around. Just overall, the farther you are from people, the less likely you are to get the virus and spread the virus to other people. The last thing is to avoid large gatherings. This picture here, I hope it's pre-COVID, um, large large gathering of people might have been a concert. Obviously, we can't be doing that right now. 
because that would be violating our social distancing as we are not anywhere near six feet away from people. So avoid those large gatherings, both indoors and outdoors. For right now, it's uh, neither safe to be in those uh, gatherings that are tons and tons of people. And then just a quick disclaimer, if you are ever experiencing symptoms of COVID-19, please stay at home and self-quarantine until you are able to receive a COVID-19 test. Fortunately, here at WashU, we are given our dorm rooms, so I am able to self-isolate in my dorm room until I am able to receive a COVID-19 test. Luckily, I've yet to show symptoms through my whole time here, and I hope that stays that way. And if that were the case that I should show symptoms, I would self-quarantine and quarantine until I get my results back. That is the most important part. You don't want to break your quarantine once you finish your test because it's not an immediate test. So there is a time where they're still testing your sample from the day before. So it's important to make sure you don't break that quarantine. Once you are negative, however, then you, then you can break that quarantine because then you know you're negative. This picture right here is worth a thousand words, goes back to what Sato Mayer, the Yale COVID-19 researcher was talking about. It's honestly amazing that this we've got a vaccine this quickly. Like I said, the flu vaccine takes 15 years, or took 15 years. We got this one in one year. So a really, really, really phenomenal, jo phenomenal job to all the researchers, everybody who put their time and effort into developing a vaccine that is now re readily available for those who are eligible in this country. So vaccines onto the second part now. So like I said, they're truly a miracle how this happens so quickly. So the vaccines that are emergency authorized in the United States, there's three of them. So the Johnson & Johnson one was authorized on February 27th, 2021. The Pfizer and Moderna vaccines were authorized a little bit before. So the Pfizer was December 11th of 2020 and the Moderna was December 18th of 2020. So for about like a two month period, Pfizer and Moderna were the only two vaccines that are emergency authorized. And hopefully there are more vaccines that become authorized with all the research going on, all the phase two and phase three trials going on, that we can get vaccines to everybody and anybody who needs them slash wants them. So like I said, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine were the only ones available for two months and they're an mRNA vaccine. So this is actually a new development in science. We've never had an mRNA vaccine. So what an mRNA vaccine does is when you, are, when you get vaccinated, that teaches our cells to make a part of the protein, which triggers an immune response in our cells. So it makes a part of that coronavirus spike protein, which we talked about earlier, which will then trigger a response into our human body cells. And that response in our body creates what we call antibodies. And this term is obviously in caps and bolded for a reason, because antibodies are what we're looking for. This is what protects us from getting infected if the real virus were to come into our body. So you might hear people who get the, unfortunately get the virus, say they have antibodies for a few months. And what that means is that they cannot be reinfected with the virus in like two or three weeks again, because their body has antibodies to fight off the virus if it comes again. Unfortunately, they have to be infected first for that to happen. But now with the vaccine, you get those antibodies within one to two weeks. And now you are protected if the real virus were to come into your body. So this mRNA vaccine is something very new in science and something that we are very fortunate to have. The Johnson & Johnson COVID vaccine is a little bit different. It modifies what we call an adenovirus with the coronavirus spike protein. And that's a piece, that, a piece that latches to the human cell that we talked about earlier, the spike protein latches onto the human cells. That adenovirus, it says virus, but it has no ability to reproduce in the human body, so it cannot cause COVID. So you should not be worried that the word virus is in adenovirus. It cannot do anything in the human body. When you get the vaccine, the modified adenovirus is pulled inside of your cells where it travels to the cell nucleus, home to its DNA, okay? And then the adenovirus puts its DNA into the nucleus. And then the spike protein gene is read by the cell and copied into what we call mRNA again. And that mRNA um, tells the cells to start making spike proteins, which is recognized by the body and makes antibodies. So again, you see antibodies bolded. Antibodies is exactly what we are looking for in these vaccines. 
So once you make antibodies, the antibodies protect you from the real virus if it were to enter into your body. So the whole goal is to create antibodies and those antibodies protect you when the real virus comes in. Both vaccines, the end goal is the same. How they get there is a little different, but the end goal is the same. Antibodies which protect you from the real virus if it enters your body. Some quick little stats on both the vax or all three of the vaccines. We have the minimum age for the Pfizer vaccine is 16. The Moderna vaccine is 18 and the Johnson and Johnson is also 18. This just happens to be who they did the trials on and which the, which the researchers feel is the safest age to give it to. The last thing we want is people being, um, unfortunately, something, a side effect that is very dangerous to them happen, which we don't want. So 18 is the age for Moderna and Johnson and Johnson. Um, Pfizer has done the research and said 16 was a minimum age for them. How many doses? So as I'm sure a lot of you have heard, if you are around people who have been vaccinated, they say I have to go for a second dose. That's because Pfizer and Moderna are both double dose vaccines, while Johnson & Johnson is only a single dose vaccine. The Pfizer second dose is taken 21 days after the first dose, and the Moderna second dose is taken 28 days after the first dose. If you know people who are eligible to get vaccinated, usually the clinic they go to automatically schedules the second dose day for them. If not, it's usually just around this time and you can ask them to 21 days or 28 days afterwards um, to get your second dose. And then after your second dose, you were considered fully vaccinated. And Johnson & Johnson, you only need one and then you're considered fully vaccinated. The vaccine effectiveness between the three um, vaccines, Pfizer is at 95%, Moderna is 94.1%, and Johnson & Johnson is 66%. Obviously, you see Johnson & Johnson is quite the outlier, but again, that is no reason to be scared. There's no reason to say, I don't want to take the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. The whole point of these vaccines is to make sure you don't have a severe reaction. The whole point is to reduce hospitalizations all the way down to, um, like I said, ensure there's no severe reaction. Johnson & Johnson does that, Pfizer does that, Moderna does that. And for relative comparison, the flu vaccine is around 60 to 70% uh, effectiveness rate. And there are people who unfortunately do get the flu when they are vaccinated, but they don't come down with the flu as hard. They are sick for a little bit and they recover. The same thing would happen with any of these vaccines. You get COVID, you might be sick for a little bit, but you will not be sent to the hospital. You will not be on a ventilator like we saw people way in the beginning of the pandemic in New York, they're running out of ventilators. None of that happens if people are vaccinated. So another um, difference between these vaccines is the storage temperature of the vaccines. So Pfizer is negative 80 degrees Celsius to 60 degrees Celsius. Moderna is negative 25 degrees Celsius to 15 degrees Celsius. And Johnson & Johnson is 2 degrees Celsius to 8 degrees Celsius. So obviously a very stark contrast between the three. Pfizer is um, at a very, very specific freezer. We in this world have never experienced negative 80 to negative 60 degrees Celsius temperatures. Um, Moderna is a little bit in a more of a regular type freezer at negative 25 to negative 15. And Johnson & Johnson is in our, uh, that's a fridge temperature, outside temperature in the fall, 2 to 8 degrees Celsius. And so that's why the Johnson Johnson vaccine is so effective, because people in rural communities who might not have access to these special freezers that can hold vaccines at negative 80 to 60 degrees, negative 60 degrees Celsius, are able to get the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, and they can the, the clinic that's there can hold it in a normal temperature that is not extraordinarily low, like the Pfizer and Moderna ones are. So uh, the side effects of the vaccine, um, there are side effects, and that is normal and it is expected. And I want to reiterate that again. Side effects are normal and they are expected. In your injection, injected arm or your injection site, you will see swelling and you may see redness and your arm may hurt for a day, maybe two days. And again, I want to reiterate that is normal and that is expected. In your whole body, you may feel tired, you may have a headache, you may have muscle pain, chills, fever, nausea, but again, that is all normal and expected. Your body re uh, reacts to almost every vaccine it's had in its life the same way. It's nothing special. There's no microchip being put into your body that's causing these side effects. There's none of that propaganda. It is normal science. 
It's just how our body reacts. And after a few days, you'll feel totally fine and um, on your way to being safe from COVID, which is the end goal of this. So speaking of the end goal, the uh, discussion on herd immunity. So herd immunity is a very interesting topic. And if we look at this picture in the top right here, so on the left, we have no herd immunity. So herd immunity, uh, just a quick definition, is the protection when enough of a population is immune to a, a disease. So we, as of right now, as a population in the United States are not at herd immunity. Not enough people are immune from the virus where we feel that everybody is protected as a herd or a society. So we would be the left, for example. So we have um, half and half really, half are susceptible to the virus, meaning that if they were in contact with someone who is infected or is symptomatic or asymptomatic, because remember this virus, it can be spread both through asymptomatic carriers and symptomatic carriers. So these are susceptible and the red people are the infected people. So if these infected people were to go around each other, they would transmit the disease. And then, so this guy, this red guy in the middle is like the starting person. And all these other people used to be blues but then he has been spreading this, per this virus out to all these blues and turning them red, okay? So these blues turn into red and now we have half the society is infected with the virus. Obviously we don't want half the society infected with the virus. However, on the right side, if all these people are blues and then all these green people go and get vaccinated, they turn green and they turn immune, the red person, even if they would interact with the green person, they can't do anything because a green person is immune and vaccinated. So they can only spread the disease to one other person. And that's how we reach herd immunity. So that means enough of these people will be safe that we will not reach a point where too many people are getting infected where it's unsafe. So experts predict anywhere from 50 to 80% will be when we reach herd immunity. And this graph on the bottom right is actually a graph from the 1918 Spanish flu. And so we see the similar death, um, we'll see the similar thing when you compare it to COVID, but you see this is when they reach herd immunity would be down here. Right here is when this dies off and enough people are immune from the, uh, the virus to the point where it's no longer a, a worldwide threat to people. So then they're able to resume back to normal society. So again, like I said previously, the main goal of this uh, lecture was to look at graphs and analyze graphs and see where, um, predict patterns in these graphs. So something that I find very interesting is that we see the same little initial spike in deaths, both in COVID and the Spanish flu. And then you see that after that initial spike, it goes back down and almost hovers over that um, x-axis line. And then you see a, something very similar here, it's just hovering over this line. But something that's very uh, different from 1918 till 2020, is that in 1918, this spiked up an insane amount, all the way almost one, two, three, five times the amount of the initial spike. While here we were fortunate enough where it was only like 1.5 or two times the initial spike. And this is for many reasons. Obviously the medical professionals in today's day and age are much more advanced than the ones back in 1918, 1919, simply due to the fact that they are um, available to more technology, they have more access to many more resources, more people, they can call anybody they want if they need help on something. So that was very nice that we did not experience something as rapid as this. But you see again, this is coming back down. This came all the way back down to the same level it was back in the beginning or towards the end of 1918. And we see this in March, towards the end of March, that it's at the same thing as it was in August and September. However, you see this goes again and spikes back up. And that's actually what experts predict is that we'll see another surge. And this is something when we're analyzing graphs from previous, um, from the past, we can also try to um, predict this. And so we will predict, experts predict some sort of spike up into the 2000 range maybe, but they're not entirely sure what the surge will be. They just predict a surge based off their data that they're collecting now and from the graph back in 1918, which we see here. And then hopefully after that surge, we'll come back down and we'll be good to go. That's the hopeful goal, but that's something to really keep in mind when analyzing graphs from history is how did the trends happen back then and how are those trends similar and different? 
we saw they were similar with the initial spike. And we saw that they were different because the peak all the way up was not the same as the peak back in 1918. So the conclusion of the vaccine lecture is the overall, my message to you is to get vaccinated if you are eligible. And how to know if you're eligible, you go just Google your state and vaccine eligibility. At the time I'm recording this lecture in Missouri, there is still um, people, there is still, they're in a phase where you do need to be eligible for that vaccine. They are not at phase three yet where everyone can be vaccinated. But hopefully in just a few weeks, they'll get to that spot where everyone can be vaccinated. It'll be readily available to anybody who signs up for an appointment. And obviously we all want to end this pandemic together. It's a group effort. So get vaccinated if you're eligible. I'll repeat that again. We want everyone who is eligible to get vaccinated. Those people who are high risk, they should go get vaccinated first. If you are not high risk, please wait your turn in line so people who are high risk can go get vaccinated. Continue to social distance. Um, keep your six feet apart. Don't go too close to people unmasked that you don't live by. That just creates more of a uh, an environment where COVID can be um, transmitted around people. Wear your mask in public and whenever you're around other people who you do not live by. It's around your face, nose, mouth, very tight. So you are protecting yourself and protecting others because we want to keep everybody safe. The next one is avoid large gatherings, both indoor and outdoor. Like I said in the beginning, both large gatherings, indoor and outdoor are very uh, dangerous. Indoor happens to be more dangerous, but that does not mean you can go outside with 100 people outdoors and it be, all of a sudden becomes safe. Just keep in mind that the more people you're around unmasked, the bigger the risk is. And that's where we go to the next point is understanding how big your bubble is. I'll use myself for an example. Let's say I have two friends who I trust dearly and they say they will only hang out with me during this pandemic. Uh, great, I, my bubble is very small. My bubble is just them. But let's say these friends now turn their backs on me and go hang out with, they go to a party with like 50 people and make a very, very um, not so smart decision in terms of the pandemic. And now they come back to me and they might be unmasked, for example. All of a sudden, my bubble is no longer two people. My bubble is now 52 people. I have the two people I'm friends with and this party that they went to 50 people with. And that's not safe at all. My bubble is way too big now. So you have to understand your bubble is not just big how is not as big as just your bubble. It's everyone you're around and their bubble. So you have to really, really keep that in mind when you're seeing who you're hanging out with. If you choose to re remain unmasked around people, how big is their bubble? And understanding that before you make a decision to be like, I choose to be unmasked around these people. So overall, these five bullet points, if we do this, this pandemic will end sooner rather than later, hopefully. And we can get back to our normal life, going to concerts, going to sporting events, doing the things we love with our friends, not having to worry about spreading the virus. So thank you very much for listening today. Uh, I appreciate your time. And like I said, hopefully this all ends sooner rather than later. Um, here are the works cited of all the sources that I use to create this slide deck and all the information I used. I would like to especially thank Dr. Krista Millage, who is my professor at WashU and a professor of my class, the second wave of the Pandemic Science and Society. I hope you all learned a lot about vaccines today and can spread this information to more people. Um, make sure this vaccine knowledge is understood throughout everyone. All the vaccines that are emergency authorized in this country are fully safe. And again, if you can get vaccinated, please, please, please go get vaccinated. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask in the comments. But other than that, thank you very much for your time. And I hope you enjoyed listening to this lecture. Thank you.